so uh, let's start with yeah our first topic today something i should have covered actually when we uh, started with time series data and cross sectional data you remember the distinction that we made you will not find this distinction in any book written in this precise way so what was the definition that we gave for time series data at least one variable for at least two periods of time okay so strict definition because when we as far as possible when we give definitions we should give them very in a very precise manner see if you give a definition like this uh, even a computer will understand it so you have to be always careful when you're talking about things in the world of business when you're discussing anything related to business you should try to speak in a manner that is so precise that even a computer will understand this kind of definition a computer will understand at least one variable for at least two periods of time but of course in practice when we look at time series data like you look at this cable chart okay it is obviously one variable but it is for many many periods of time okay but it fits the definition of at least one variable for at least that's why I use the word at least right for at least two periods of time so even 50,000 periods of time is is allowed under at least two periods of time are you following that right okay so uh, that's the definition of time series and what is cross-sectional data yes yeah one point of time only you said at least one point of time that's not correct that means seven points of time is also and one point of time then there will be no distinction between time series data and cross-sectional data right so you can't have that so you have to be very that's why uh, so you understand now how particular you have to be about the word use of words not she just added that at least she said at least two variables for at least one point of time but that at least changes the definition it makes it wrong because what seven periods of time is also the same as at least one. it satisfies the rule of at least one point of time but seven points of time is not cross-sectional data cross-sectional data is here all the bid prices if you just look at the first column all the bid prices and if you take a snapshot now with uh, with your phone this is cross-sectional data one point of time you took a snapshot with your phone and these are all the prices for all these different variables so you have at least what did we say at least two variables at least two variables okay so 75,000 variables is also within covered by at least two variables okay so at least two variables but for one point of time only so you can even like you know really poke the computer in the eye and make it make sure it understands for one point of time only right did you shut it properly yes sir you yes. shut it properly okay is this clear to everybody basic definitions we are rehashing once again but you have to be very very careful about the use of words okay okay so something else we should have covered when i uh, because i was under so much panic and time pressure at that time uh, trying to teach you all the stuff for the exam for the core for the project so we also have to cover stock uh, stock concepts and flow concepts why because whenever i cover any concept i try as far as possible to cover every other concept that is related to those concepts okay so can you see have you guys heard of this these terms stock concepts and flow concepts you've heard of it chuk has heard of it is nodding aggressively what have you heard chuk it was taught in uh, microeconomics a stock is a concept which means uh, one particular not a stock is a concept a stock concept stock concept it means that uh, so you have done that population is actually a stock concept but okay. the bird trade has been that we flow concept what is being added and subtracted to the already existing is flow okay so if i ask you and what is the flow concept so the birth rate and the death rate are the flow concept birth rate and death rate okay okay then if i ask you guys anybody wants to give another better bet okay we don't have so much time today because i only do so the interactive business is uh, there is a real trade off involved because if i try to ask people okay vaishali what do you think ritesh what do you think but it's it's maybe more engages the students a little more but it costs such a lot in terms of time right so uh, so you have to understand that trade off so uh, can you relate uh, i made one distinction between time series data and cross sectional data 
can you guys relate so uh, can you guys so so i guess most of you have some idea about stock concepts and flow concepts so can you relate stock concepts and flow concepts the difference between the two because obviously these are mutually exclusive right a stock concept can't be a flow concept and vice versa right so and similarly time series data can't be cross sectional data right so can you relate this this is all in your notes itself so you don't have to talk, take notes for this because it's all in the file that is shared with you okay that you still have access to all right now stock concepts and flow concepts can you relate this distinction to the other distinction that we made about time series data and cross sectional data Okay. Okay. Very good. So uh, I will just make some changes to your language because you have actually equated the two. Uh, so, but she's correct. So she's got the right distinction. Okay, the right comparison. So it's basically think about this. So what I'm saying to her is that I would just make some changes to her language and say that. Um, they are not the same, but they are similar too. The distinctions are similar. That's why I'm teaching them together. So you've been taught the distinction between time series data and cross-sectional data. So similar, a, a similar distinction is the one between a stock concept and a flow concept. And so what Behek has correctly pointed out is that a uh, a flow concept is most is more in line with time series data. It's similar to the idea of time series data, because as he gave an example, let me give you some other examples uh, of a flow concept. Uh, so let's first give you give you the theory first so a flow concept we'll see how it works a flow concept is much more like time series data because it's a over a period of time kind of concept and time series data also as you can see in this chart of cable you can see that it is from say 21st august to today right so it's over a period of time okay and when you look at cross-sectional data in our uh, chart of uh, prices you look at cross-sectional data whether you look at it like this or you look at it as uh, this this way it's the same thing is here we're just highlighting the last few decimals same thing if you take a picture of this at any point of time with your phone cross-sectional data because it's a snapshot at a point of time of a whole bunch of variables okay so what she's saying is the stock concept is much more like cross-sectional data because it's, it refers to a picture at a point of time to information at a point of time only is everyone clear about this have you understood this we will understand it a little bit better if we now look at some examples okay so is this first point clear first we are just giving you the theory that first we are telling you that there is a similar distinction between i mean when you study time series versus cross-sectional there's another similar distinction that you should be taught which is stock concept versus flow concept right and then we are making a relationship between we are establishing some uh, relationship between the two we are saying uh, time series uh, cross-sectional data and stock concepts are similar and time series data and flow concepts are similar okay now let's look at some examples what is sales now we're talking about is it a stock concept or a flow concept sales say I look at IBM I look at the IBM uh, you know financials okay I won't give you much more of a clue than that I look at the IBM financial statements and I look at sales I said 23 billion dollars sales is a stock concept okay anybody else that different everybody is unanimous that IBM sales who is saying flow concept parol yeah okay parol and shuchi yes shuchi why do why is it a slow why is it a flow concept okay so you're right about the first part but your second statement is a bit too strong because financials also include balance sheet which is not a period of time concept but anyway i've given you a hint about the next question so <laughs> i should not have mentioned i should not have corrected the second part of your statement the second part of your statement is too strong because you're saying that you made a statement saying that financials are declared for a period of time which means that means they're only declared for period for a period of time which is not true because the balance sheet is not a period of time but anyway let me not give you more hints okay next is cash balance yes cash balance Ritesh stock concept why is it a stock concept 
Yes. Why is it a stop concept? Okay. Correct. So yeah. So he's correct. So uh, it's a cash balance is shown on the balance sheet. So he's making another good connection. Whenever you are talking about these kind of things that appear in financial statements. Okay, one good way to uh, categorize them is to immediately think about whether this appears on a PNL or a balance sheet. Okay, so he's correctly pointed out that a balance sheet. So he's made a sequential argument that cash balance appears on a balance sheet and balance sheet is pre prepared at a point of time. You notice the balance sheet always says as at 31st December. Yes, sir. Okay, so it's a snapshot at a point of time. It is not for the fiscal year ended for 31st December. It is as at 31st December. Okay. So balance sheet is a point of time snapshot. Okay. So therefore cash so is a good way to answer the question. You have made a logical argument. Okay. Okay. Next is industrial production. Okay. Some are stocking up on flows. Yes. Stock concept, flow concept. Yes, Garvit. Sir, industrial production. Flow concept. Flow concept. Yes. Why? Uh, sir, because the uh, industrial production, sir, because the production uh, will be in the uh, will not be at at a particular time. It will be between a time span. Okay, fine. So your language need, uh, needs improvement, but uh, I understand what you're saying. So industrial production is a kind of report which you see that comes out I mean if you look at that Econo Day calendar that I showed you guys okay from there you see even Indian industrial production Indian economic data is reflected in that global calendar okay so industrial production data will keep coming out from time to time but it will be for the month of July or for the quarter ended uh, you know 30th, 30th June okay so industrial production is a kind of information which will be always shown over a period of time you know as pertaining to a period of time it could be five years one year three months whatever so therefore industrial production is a flow concept okay so it's more like a time series data concept so it's a flow concept then accounts receivable all the money that Hardik goes you yes yes stock concept why is it a stock concept balance sheet right accounts receivable is always shown as uh, the amount that is at, at a point of time it's a balance sheet item okay good so all right so accounts receivable we can do this okay so there's another important concept distinction that i wanted to add to the time series cross-sectional data so you see one example in in financial markets actually there are many other important examples of cross-sectional data we should highlight that which we are not able to cover at this point of time due to lack of uh, time uh, and those are things like yield curves okay implied volatility term structure all those things which you should uh, be aware that we are our coverage of our coverage of time series data for uh, charts for financial markets is more or less okay okay but our coverage of cross-sectional data charts with financial markets is incomplete because important things like yield curves term structure charts for uh, implied volatilities okay other uh, types of cross-sectional data chart that we have not had time to cover we'll hopefully cover it uh, in the the next course okay so all that you know about time series data at this point of time is on, only this that this is just a snapshot of a bunch of things a bunch of variables at a point of time we can close this now all right so next we have to go into some very important calculations on trading systems okay you have to understand now if you go back to your um, decision problems the list of decision problems as Mehak was pointing out yesterday we have not covered this adequately okay the number of units because this is an important decision that you have to take whenever you're trying to trade anything like if you want to join uh, me on my cable short and you want to go short you want to go short cable what happened there should be a pop out yeah so the moment you try to sell cable what is the system asking you to specify units the system wants to know how many units you want to sell 
okay so this is not something to be determined arbitrarily although many even professional traders determine it arbitrarily but that's wrong okay there should be a structured way to determine it uh, which is an integral to your risk management approach okay the position size is how you control your risk really because the entry and the exit are pretty much determined by the market conditions okay so this is very important we need to figure out uh, a way to determine this okay so we'll just close this for now <coughs> all right so how do we decide the position size now with respect to this and uh, also with respect to um yeah pretty much to this and then also the management of pr uh, profitable positions okay that also requires uh, a lot of planning and a lot of calculations okay as you can see generally the management of losing positions is not that complicated because you just put a stop and the market goes through the stop that's it that cycle is over and you start again with the new analysis for another trade but once you have a profitable if the market is moving in your uh, favor then there's a lot of things that you have to do like pyramiding you have to understand the position size and there are so many things related to the planning of the trading system which we are going to cover now okay so let's look at the first concept which is risk per trade okay now so far i had told you for the purposes of your project because we did not have time to uh, cover this in detail so i gave you a thumb rule saying that you should just use one percent okay so you were supposed to use only one percent of your uh, so this is what I told you here when we were do doing the calculations here. I said you take 1% uh, of your annual risk capital, define your risk capital and the for purposes of this project, your risk capital was given to you as $1 million. So you take 1% of $1 million as your risk capital. Okay. So this 1% now, actually that's an arbitrarily determined figure that I gave you because I wanted it to be a low figure. But there's actually a better way to determine this 1%, whether it should be 1% or 2% or half percent or whatever. Okay. So we are now going to come to that okay for that you look at position size this sheet is already in your folder so you can access the sheet so let's look at something which is um, how are we going to determine the uh, so under system edge itself we can find this okay so let's look at the way you're going to determine this so let me just give you the theory first okay so the way you determine the risk per trade okay uh, which is going to be a dollar amount it's going to come out as a dollar amount okay the way you determine it is that we basically we want to have this approach now there's actually no um, So opposite of deterministic is probabilistic. You guys have done a Monte Carlo simulation and all that. I think you'll be doing that with DG Sir in this corporate finance modeling course. Okay. Yeah. You have done before in FM. Okay. Okay. So Monte Carlo simulation is of simulation, but simulation gives you so that two words you need to know deterministic and probabilistic. These are opposites okay deterministic and probabilistic so what i'm trying to say is that when you make a probabilistic so when you're doing things like monte carlo simulations they give you probabilistic outputs like they give you a probability distribution of outcomes okay so you in a probability distribution you don't know that this will happen for certain you just know that certain events have certain probabilities associated with them okay so that's a probabilistic estimate of what might happen all right but a deterministic estimate means if i say that chandrayaan will lead our lunar probe will reach the will hit the surface of the will land on the surface of the moon in 29 days and 30 uh, and 13 hours okay now that's a deterministic statement okay that's a precise statement and because of everything there is quite stable we don't suddenly the gravity of the earth does not change okay uh, so uh, therefore everything is predictable so we can that's why people are able to predict so uh, precisely when this thing will land and when this thing will reach that surface okay so that's a that's an example of a deterministic focus Forecast, that we are making a precise forecast that it will land exactly 29 days and 13 hours later etc okay so that's the difference between deterministic and probabilistic so you should be aware of these terms that sometimes when you are in a position to make a deterministic with respect to like when will the sun rise tomorrow in Delhi we can say that because we know the speed at which the earth is uh, uh, revolving okay so we can so those are not they, they don't give a probability estimate that the sun will probably rise at 6 30 years right they give you a precise time okay so that's a deterministic forecast okay the 
opposite of that is a probabilistic forecast where they because of the situation you don't have a very good idea as to exactly what will happen but you can give some probabilities okay and even those probabilities men in many cases are very subjective okay in certain cases probabilities are objective like when you're looking at game of, uh, at a game of cards uh, like uh, you know what is the probability of getting an ace of spades those are more objective because we know the situation now suddenly the number of uh, you know aces will not change in a deck of cards okay because, but in the case of things like hurricanes and typhoons and all those are because we don't really know so those are much more dicey to predict okay but those are all probabilistic predictions okay so is this clear first you've learned two terms now deterministic versus probability so what we are saying is as far as the risk per trade is concerned there is really no deterministic way okay to to set this okay this by this I mean uh, risk per trade we are trying to determine this risk per trade now okay so there is no deterministic way to set this let me just remove this opposite of deterministic is probabilistic so what we do is basically we make the most conservative made a uh, most conservative assumption possible about the run of losing trades okay so what is the meaning of you understand what what we say what we mean when we say conservative assumption most conservative assumption means in the sense that which exposes us to the least risk of being wrong okay so the least risk of being wrong so if i think that it will take uh, if, if, if it is actually true that it will take say let's say uh, you know 10,000 soldiers to retake uh, say Pakistani occupied Kashmir if you are the army head of the army chief if you are the army chief and if you think actually it will take 10,000 uh, soldiers you would probably estimate that it will take like 18,000 or 20,000 soldiers so you estimate uh, in excess okay so here that would be a conservative estimate if we know for a fact that only 10,000 soldiers will be required but we estimate we we set the number as 20,000 so then we say it's a conservative estimate this is clear okay so when it comes to losses we are going to assume more losses we are going to assume maximum losses so when it comes to a conservative so we are going to make the most conservative assumption possible about the run of losing trades okay run of losing trades is nothing but obviously just like when you have um, I think my computer is hanging okay okay so we'll just wait for it to come back so the most conservative what is the run of losing trades a run of losing trades is nothing but if you if you do a lot of trades okay some of them are going to be winners and some of them are going to be losers is that okay you understand that just like when you flip a coin some will be heads and some will be tails and a run a run is actually a term that is, that comes from statistics okay so what we mean by a run so this is actually a statistical trap term there's actually something called a theory of runs which is again a statistical uh, you know branch of statistics which tries to estimate like things like when you're tossing an unbiased coin what is the probability that you will get a certain number of heads in a row so even if the coin is unbiased you can actually get many heads in a row that doesn't mean that the coin is biased okay so similarly run of losing trades so basically run of losing trades is like this it means uh, loss 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 then win okay so we have basically a run of six losses we have a run of six losses now the distribution of trades can be like this then you can have a win then you can have a loss win then you can have a loss uh, then you can have a loss then you can have a win then you can again have another run of losses this can be a run of 13 losses okay so this is what is meant by runs so the run in statistical uh, parlance in uh, this context that we are covering right now a run has a very different connotation from saying i am running to the canteen okay to so it's it's a different concept of run okay the different use of the word run so this is what we mean by a run of losing trades this, uh, are you clear about this now okay when you're talking about a run of losing trades obviously if you're running a trading system if you're operating a trading system you'll be doing many trades and when you're doing many trades you are going to later on when you look at the distribution of trades it'll it'll be something like this it may be something different it may be like 10 losses in a row initially then 15 winners then three losses then five winners it'll be some kind of distribution. it could be all kinds of things okay but there will be some distribution do you understand that if you do thousands of trades 
okay even if you do hundreds of trades there will be some distribution at the end you can distribute look at the sequence of trades that the first trade was a loser second was a winner so on and so forth so this is what we mean by the run of losing trades so how do we do that so so far you are following okay we are trying to there is no deterministic way to be sure so we are trying to set up very very conservative estimates so that we are not wrong about the we are we want to find out basically the risk we want to set a very low risk per trade by making very conservative assumptions we are going to assume that we are going to lose almost all the time that kind of approach and then we'll set the risk per trade so that we are we don't get surprised on the negative side okay are you following the philosophy here the approach right okay so it's like you need if you need like 20 crores to start a bakery business you are going to start it with 60 crores of capital so maybe you need 20 crores maybe first three years you'll lose 20 crores actually before the business becomes profitable but in order to be extra conservative what you're doing is you're starting the business with equity capital of 60 crores so it's three times the amount that you think actually will be required okay so that's what is meant by a conservative approach to risk planning okay all right so what we do is first we have to project the number of trades okay now that is a function of your understanding of your system okay so this part you don't worry about at this point of time where we are just going to because there's an additional way that you can program okay so these are all examples where you're trying to model one variable as a function of other variables okay so these are all examples of uh, the use of models in finance because even a simple model like y is equal to a plus uh, you know a plus bx that is also a model okay it doesn't have to be something highly complicated in the partial differential equation or those are also models and these are also models okay so we'll do a theory of models later on where we look at the fundamentals but here these are all examples where you're modeling uh, one variable as a function of others okay so first we have to project the number of trades so let's say that we are projecting for our uh, and this is obviously for a particular period okay this is all for one period let's assume it's one year okay all of these uh, trading system calculations are all based on some kind of one uh, some kind of trading horizon okay a trading horizon we use the word trading horizon or uh, trading period okay it's always ready to, you can do it for a quarter also you can do it for a month also but it will be related to some period okay risk capital when we talk about risk capital like your risk capital of 1 million dollars was given to you for a period of about 5 weeks you basically had about five weeks so understand this that cap risk capital and investable capital these are all related to some period because if you talk about 20 year uh, trading period the risk capital will have to be bigger than if you're talking about one quarter right so these are always related to the concept of period okay so um, all right so so let's look at this let me just clarify this also so that most um, I'm just writing calc okay Is this clear? So for all your trading system calculations, things like trading period, uh, risk capital, investable capital, okay, usually there will be some period attached to it, okay. So um, now, so the, what we are doing is, so I'm not writing the period specially in this, okay. We're going to say, let's say for this example, this calculation is one year, okay. For one year, okay, is, uh, let's say we can even write it here. In one year, there usually we have about 250 trading days, okay, in the financial markets globally. If you're trading in the global foreign exchange markets, we will typically assume 250 trading days because 52 weeks, Saturday, Sunday markets don't trade. 52 weeks, so that's 104 days gone from 365. So you start with 365 days minus 104. And what you have left roughly with the holidays and everything, it comes to around 250, okay. So we assume about 250 days, okay. So for 250 days, I've assumed that you do two trades for every day. So therefore you are going to do 500 trades. Okay. This spreadsheet is all in your folder. You can access this. You can see the formulas later. Just try to follow what is being done. Okay. So why don't you guys come forward? Uh, Aurora and uh, Pulkit, why don't you come and sit on the first bench? Come sit on the first bench. Okay. Uh, so, uh, 
number of trades i'm assuming that 250 trading days in a year i'm going to do two trades per day so my total projected so these are all projections okay these are projections therefore these are what we call ex ante you understand ex ante versus ex post yeah ex ante you've done this in legal aspects of business ex ante versus ex post ex ante is we are predict uh, i think i've written the definition somewhere else okay ex ante projections we are doing most of them are ex, uh, these are actually ex ante but i'll see where um, let me see if this if i have this yeah okay system edge i've, I've defined as um, can be uh, so I, i've defined it there okay so we are right now doing ex ante calculations so it can be uh, the thing can be these uh, calculations can be either ex ante or ex post okay in ex post you are working at the end of your trading period if you trade for one year at the end of the trading period you can go back and look at your performance and then you can do some actual realized values okay that i lost 16 percent now that's an ex post figure because that's an actual figure of what you lost but ex ante you may project that you are going to make 15 percent that's an ex ante projection okay so therefore it's not certain all right so we are right now doing ex ante calculations time to determine risk per trade all right what are we doing number of trades we are saying is going to be 500 trades we are going to be doing 500 trades okay at any point of time if you don't follow please ask okay 250 trading days two trades per day 500 trades now we are projecting 75 percent losers okay because we want to show you a very conservative approach all right no in fact you may not have 75 percent losers but you should still work with very high uh, uh you know estimates of losers okay so for instance i i always use 75 percent at the beginning of every trading period although i've never had 75 percent losers but i always assume that i'll have 75 percent losers so that's a conservative approach because you never want to be surprised on the wrong side see if you expect to lose 10 million dollars and you lose 5 million dollars it's okay but if you expect to lose 3 million and you lose 7 million that's not okay they're not the same you understand that there's a certain asymmetry in that so you always expect to lose much more than you think you should plan to lose that uh, you when you're doing a risk planning you should make very very conservative assumptions this is a conservative approach to trading which i feel is better because at least it allows you to gives you a better chance of survival because most of the time what happens with traders is they don't survive that after one or two good years because they're all basically very aggressive and then after one or two you can't afford to be really aggressive in the market unless it's going in your favor so you can do things like pyramiding which is aggression but uh, you know off in general you have to be very very careful you have to be very cautious okay if you want to survive okay so if you are too aggressive you have poor risk control you will get taken out by the market sooner or later you will see most of the funds after two or three years they have a big blowout and then they have to close okay so by making ultra conservative assumptions you ensure your survival over long periods of time okay so we are going to be very conservative we are going to assume 75 percent losers okay so which means number of losing trades is you can see number of losing trades is percentage losers into number of trades okay so i'm expecting this can eat losers okay so now what i'm going to assume is here you see that i put in this thing the blue ones are for user input i put in this as 100 percent okay so now i'm going to now that i have a projection for the total number of losing trades okay i could additionally make an assumption now we go back to the idea of runs we go back to the idea of runs so you know you know that some kind of distribution like this is going to happen you don't know what it's going to actually be but you know that something like this is going to happen there'll be some run of losses there'll be a run of winners then there'll be another run of losses something like this is going to happen so what you do is you make the most conservative assuming that your uh, thing is correct okay this is such a conservative assumption about percentage losses that most people will probably not have such a high percentage of losses okay so you assume that your estimate of percentage losses is correct okay so therefore you assume uh, your estimate of number of losses is correct okay number of losses number of losing trades okay number of losing trades 375 you assume is correct now you make the question now question is how are these 375 losers going to be distributed is it going to be six losses initially then two winners one loss one winner maybe 25 losses or is it going to be something else we are going to make such a conservative assumption that it can't be worse than that so we make the worst case assumption okay most conservative assumption possible which is basically worst case yeah i said already here worst case what i do is i first what am i doing number of project the number of trades number two project number of losses percentage losses from here you can get 
number of losses so from percentage losses you get number of losses is this clear from number of trades and percentage losses you get number of losses now you stack them all up front so you are projecting 375 losing trades in total you assume that your first 375 trades are losers so can't be worse than that right any other assumption that you make is going to be leaning very much towards a probabilistic estimate and it may may not work out okay it may actually get worse than that but if you do if you assume all 375 are stacked in the beginning it can't be worse than that right okay so then what we do is then obviously if we know that let's assume that this instead of six losers is 375 losers okay then obviously according if our calculations are correct if our estimates are correct after the 375 losers the rest have to be all winners okay so we want to be able to have capital remember we are just trying to determine risk capital risk per trade as a function of our risk capital because nobody not even bill gates has infinite risk capital everybody has a finite risk capital number so you will have a risk capital number given by your investor okay so you work with that you take that risk capital number and then we are going to use it to derive the risk per trade so therefore now i'm going to make the so after 375 losers everything else will be a winner after that so i want to have enough capital to be able to uh, survive those 375 losses and still make the next trade and after that it will be all winners okay are you following my logic how how the situation is visualized how you make a most conservative assumption okay so therefore how will i derive because remember what i'm trying to derive is my risk per trade so what am i going to do for my risk per trade you notice what the risk per, what am i going to do i'm going to take what is my risk cap look at something else we have put in invest ic is investable capital okay invested capital or we can make it investable you remember we made this distinction between you remember at the very beginning we made the distinction about in between investable capital which is an ex ante concept and a risk capital uh, investable capital is ex ante and invested capital is exposed so your your investor gives you a certain amount of pool of money okay in in your case in your project we assume that your investable capital is 1 million dollars and your risk capital is also 1 million dollars okay but need not always be the same usually it will be the case that and remember that this is not a distinction that most people in the market think about only typically futures traders think about this but large percentage of the investing universe even the professional investing universe does not think actively about risk capital but it's a very important approach it's very important to be aware of your risk capital because that that's how your risk taking ability is defined it's not defined by your investable capital because think about most investors if you are investing say 100 million rupees in the stock market for if you are saying putting it to uh, you know putting it into the market to play with for one year are you prepared to lose the 100 million rupees full most people will say no right so there is a concept of risk capital in the concept uh, as distinguished from investable capital you may have 100 million, 100 million rupees of disposable liquidity okay which is essentially your uh, investable capital okay disposable liquidity for purposes of investment okay but that does not mean that you are prepared to lose the whole amount so the risk capital is actually the amount that you are willing to lose and not have a problem and not like go and shoot yourself or something like that after that okay so it should be something you are willing to lose and you in business there's always losses when you set up a business you budget for losses so this is like a budgeted loss that's your risk capital okay so you may have 100 million rupees to deploy in the stock market as a investable capital figure but your risk capital may just be 40 mil, uh, 40 million rupees that 40 million you will you're willing to risk as a business risk that this is okay 40 million rupees if i lose it's not a disaster okay is this clear so this distinction is very important but unfortunately even professional investors many of them don't actually think about it actively and there are reasons for that they don't the reason they don't think about it is because customers are not beating up on them forcing them to think about it that's why they don't have to think about it many traditional asset managers okay so but future traders think about this but it's very important from the point of view of learning how to invest professionally you should have this distinction and you will not find this distinction in any finance textbook also okay but it's a very important distinction investable capital reflects your liquidity but risk capital reflects your risk appetite okay 
so therefore risk capital is to be distinguished from investable capital so we have an investable capital figure in this example of we have 100 million are you happy Aurora you want more 100 million is okay okay good so we have 100 million of investable capital but how much are we willing to lose out of that so we have another 20 percent so we have another field for user input all the user input is in blue okay cyan actually so we have another row for user input which is percentage of investable capital okay ic is investable capital so let me just write it here also investable capital So investable versus, uh, let me just write it here. I think I've written it somewhere else in your notes, but anyway, let me just write it once again. Okay. So before that, let's, um, let's make this, I don't know where, maybe I've written it somewhere, investable capital, investable capital, and we have this concept of. invested capital we are making this distinction versus risk cap cap is for capital is okay everybody understand risk cap very important distinction okay right now in I've used two words investable investable is ex ante okay in a sense it's a kind of ex ante concept and invested is an ex post concept because See, ex, uh, all we are trying to say here is that investable capital means when, when the investor gives you a liquidity of $100 million, okay? So the investor transfers $100 million to your account, okay? So that still remains in the money manager's account, the asset manager's account as $100 million initially just of cash. Out of that $100 million, if you spend $10 million buying shares of Apple, now you have invested $10 million in the shares of Apple. So you had investable capital of $100 million. So when you invest some of that, it becomes invested capital. Now, even that $10 million you have invested to buy shares of Apple doesn't mean that you are willing to lose that entire $10 million. So that is still invested capital in Apple shares, but the actual risk capital may be much less. Uh, okay, so there's still a distinction whether you are talking about investable or you're talking about invested. Invested means past tense. Investable has a sense of kind of future tense because I'm giving you this money. This is available for invested investment. So this is I have the money manager has investable capital of 100 million. Is this clear? Okay, so this distinction, the more important distinction is between IC and RC that either invested or investable capital distinction between that and risk capital that is the more important one and within that also within ic also you can have investable or invested that's not so important uh, but it's but still it's something that you should be aware of is this clear okay all right so we are saying so we need one more term one more um, so this is how you do your risk planning okay so you need one more so here i've given you a lot of flexibility to define uh, the the stuff okay so um, Okay, uh, did I mention this? So let me just complete the, come back to that. So I've got one more row to define what is the percentage of IC that is equal to my RC. That is, if I was willing to lose my entire investable capital, then it, this figure would be 100%. Here I've entered 20%. Okay, so I've said only 20% of my risk cap, investable capital is risk capital. Okay. So now I'll just come back to this that going back to the risk. So my risk capital here because of this 20% is 100 million is IC. So RC is 20 million because I've entered 20%. Okay. All right. Now just going back to this percentage of losing trades in the maximum run. Okay. What we are trying to say here is that there will be some run of trades when you, as you are trading or once you finish trading, you can see there will be some run of trades. And I was just here. I've given some flexibility in terms of uh, programming where you can enter that is, even though your maximum run, your total number of losing trades is 375. You could be less than 100% uh, conservative. I've shown you the most conservative approach. Okay. But if you wanted to be, if you didn't want to be so conservative, you could have said that, okay, out of my 375 uh, losing trades, 
the percentage that will occur in the worst possible run of trades here the worst possible run of losses if you look at this distribution the worst possible run of losses is six because the other is only one so when you have two run uh, this is basically uh, you, you can even call this a run even one item but here you have a run of six losses and you have only one here so the worst possible is six later on if you do the full distribution of your trades you may find that there's some higher number that there is a place where there are like 27 losses in a row okay so if you wanted to are you following what i'm saying if you want it to be less than 100 percent conservative if you want it to be not so conservative as what i'm recommending then you could make this little lower maybe you could make it 60 percent okay so then you'll see later on some of the numbers will change but we are not going to do that for the moment okay we are just going to keep it simple and we are just going to be ultra conservative okay so we are going to assume that the worst case that if there are going to be 375 losing trades let's assume that all 375 are stacked up front okay total number of losses stack them all up front this is the worst case and then you have to leave money for one more trade because you should have money to do the next trade because then from next then onwards is going to be winners right so if you look at a lot of research on trading systems you can have very high number of losses in a trading system and then after that you can have winners a run of winners so if you don't uh, have capital to trade or sometimes you don't have emotional capital because trading is a very emotional business you're losing money immediately so when somebody has 16 17 losses in a row then the 18th time when they're getting a signal even though the system is giving you a signal to buy the human being will actually not buy because he'll think that oh my god i've lost money 70 i don't want to lose any more time any more money and then that 70 trade turns out to be the one that makes a huge amount of money that would have made a huge amount of money and then you don't do that okay so therefore discipline is also very important in uh, the psychological aspect that's why i've asked you to read that book the discipline trader by mark douglas which you can find online actually you get the pdf online a uh, very important book okay so are you following what we are doing so far so here we're just giving you flexibility but we are going to not uh, for the purpose of the example we are assuming that all 375 trades occur so now how am i going to decide remember the ultimate goal here is to decide the risk per trade we are going to decide the risk per trade so what is the risk per trade i've got 20 million dollars of risk capital what do i need to ensure i've got 20 million of risk capital yes what chug is not convinced Oh, you're listening okay 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 good because i'm very demanding i expect to see like uh, real uh, you know your face lighting up or <laughs> you know your uh, a strong uh, indication of of the fact that you have understood okay so um, uh, so i've got 20 million dollars of risk capital and i'm projecting 375 losing trades in a row okay so i will have one i want to have a constant number one constant number as for dollar risk per trade how much am i going to risk on each trade so i've got i've got 375 plus i want to have money left over for one more trade right okay so therefore what should i do in deriving look at these uh, so i've got uh, this look at this row uh, g5 look at this cell g5 and look at this cell g9 okay and in dollar risk per trade okay what have i got look at the formula here okay g17 is the same as um, what is g75 yeah this is max run of losers from the start because this is actually connected to this figure 100 percent okay so that's why the formula takes this because it allows you the flexibility but therefore we take it from this 375 you can see the same as number of losing trades okay so this 53 here is g17 which is the total number of losing trades 375 losing trades okay plus one is my divisor so total number of losing trades i need to have money left for one more trade so i need to have money for 376 trades if i risk a constant amount per trade so i effectively i'm assuming like 376 losing trades okay then uh, i need to have money for 375 76 trades okay so is this clear are you following the divisor you understood the divisor one minute okay and what is the divide uh, the uh, what do you call the term i've forgotten what the term in the numerator is called dividend, dividend. no the dividend is the result okay whatever okay so um, now what is in the what is in the numerator here guys g9 what is g9 
What is 20 million is our? 20 million is our risk capital. Right? So we are dividing G9. Maybe I can make this a little smaller so you can see everything. But then people at the back won't be able to see. Can you still see? Parul, can you still see? Okay. Now you can see. Okay. So we are dividing. We are dividing our risk capital by 375 plus 1. We are going to have 375 because I need to have money left over for one more trade because if I divide by 375 okay I will get a certain number okay and let's say that number is X okay so if I divide 20 million by 375 and the now and the, uh, the quotient is X and if I risk X per trade then 375 into X is 20 million then I've already blown up my whole risk capital at the end of my run of losing trades I've already blown up my entire risk capital then I don't have money to place the next bet no because because the next trades are all going to be winners after 375 losers you don't have any more losers all are winners so all you need is that money to do that one winning trade the one trade after 375 yeah see when do you need risk capital you need we are not talking about investable capital to put up margin or to actually buy the stock if it's a thing we are talking only about risk capital which means you need to be able to fund your losses now after 375 losing trades you don't have to fund losses anymore because there are no more losses after that it's all profits so you just need to have money available to make that next bet because technically you don't know whether you you have uh, that whether it's going to be a profit or not so you should be able to because you need to be able to justify theoretically because if you are blown out see even though your projection shows that these are all winners after 375 strictly speaking when you put on the next trade you need to have uh, the capital in your account to put uh, that one put on the next one trade okay so therefore i've kept that that capital that uh, justification for that justification i've kept it as one okay all right okay so uh, is this clear so far guys are you following what we are doing here very conservative okay you could also actually technically you could also put 17 but let's uh, just put d17 but let's assume you need that extra money for that one trade okay the extra justification of the risk capital for one trade okay because here your account balance is also going down remember 375 when you're starting with a lose run of losers your account balance is also going down from the starting balance of 1 billion uh, from from starting balance of 100 million the starting balance of 100 million the account balance is going down right so from here now if you start making winners start having winners your account balance will also start rising okay so we are just giving this as one okay but there is a case for what you're saying that there is a case for making it for another 125 trades also okay you could do that that would be even more conservative because then your quotient will be even lower your risk per trade will be even lower okay all right so we are going to do it this way for the moment yes yeah but we usually have about 10 holidays that's why i mentioned holidays you you you'll have like christmas you'll have christmas good friday those kind of grades markets don't operate because mass markets are mostly driven by uh, you know the i'm talking about from a global perspective you can always localize this calculation like in japan in japan there are many holidays so if you're trading japanese equities the number will be even lower than 250 because japan is almost like 20 25 holidays they are like india in that respect okay so uh, so Jap if you are trading Jap so you can localize this i have given you an example for the international foreign uh, for the global foreign exchange markets where we assume about 10 or 11 holidays okay so that's what you normally get in if you're looking at global holidays like good friday okay then uh, you know christmas and those kinds of things okay so that's why you have those 10 holidays so that's why it's 250 okay are you clear so far that we want to have money left for one more trade okay 
so uh, okay so for the moment we'll work with this okay but Mayak has raised an important point that we should also perhaps I mean there, there is also a case for doing this but for the moment we'll work with this idea that you have uh, 17 plus 1 okay so this is our dollar risk per trade are you following now so this is how you de derive your dollar risk per trade and what is it coming out to be as a percentage of this is another thing that we want to look at the dollar risk per trade remember i gave you a figure of one percent earlier i gave you a figure of one percent earlier okay so we want to put it in a different way so that figure is now turning out to be 0.27 percent so this is actually a better way to calculate your risk capital per trade requirement okay rather than a one percent requirement because it, it is connected then it becomes it's much richer it's much more well connected to the nature of your trading system if you have a trading system which does not trade too often then you'll have a fewer number of trades then you can put more money on the on each trade okay so if you put this let's say you do one only uh, say 200 if you reduce this see right now your dollar risk per trade is 53000 roughly okay if you change this to say 250 obviously it will you can double it you can double the dollar risk per trade okay so this is connected to the nature of your trading system how frequently it trades are you following so far okay so we have learned one important thing how to actually calculate dollar risk per trade as a function of the nature of your trading system and you're also getting an understanding of how, what are the aspects of a trading system you need to look at yeah yeah no no you can just take the rounded dollar amount you can just take the dollar rounded dollar amount okay no what do you mean by one single share no 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 it's not a share it's a trade we are we are now calculating dollar risk per trade and which is actually basically dollar risk per okay a risk per actually what we should clarify remember when we discussed that it's actually risk per unique stop loss remember when we discussed the uh, aspect of pyramiding on the on on the tcs shares you are looking at so it's actually not even risk per trade it's when we loosely say risk per trade but what we really mean is risk per unique stop when you look at if you remember when we were looking at tcs shares we were pyramiding we had a long position we went long over here we learned wrong over here okay and then it had gone up to this point and we raised the stop on this one uh, part of the stop part of the position we raised the stop to this point okay so 500 shares we had put a stop over here and then we wanted to buy additional shares here and then we wanted to put a stop here okay for that short term trading system you remember all that okay so this was actually not so this again would have had to follow the risk per trade rules of the short term trading system so actually when we say risk per trade what we really mean is risk per unique stop trigger level because it is actually not one trade you see this you understand what i try to understand what because the note is already there in your notes the writing is there in your, but understand what it means the reason i'm saying it's actually not risk per trade per se strictly speaking we use it because it's a brief uh, expression but it's actually risk per unique stop level because this is the unique stop level there are actually two trades that will be riding on this unique stop level because there is a 500 share lot from the previous purchase and then there is a new lot we are going to buy over here some number of shares so there's actually not one trade there's two trades which are riding on this stop but the stop is unique are you following that every trading system is defined by a conceptually like a le level of zoom like this zooming le this zoom level is much higher much much more zoomed in than this trading system the long term system which had a stop over here right if you look at this from a 60 minute chart hopefully you can still see that so this idea should be very clear in your mind that every trading system is divine, defined by a conceptually by a zoom level so we had when we bought 1000 shares of tcs at this point we bought 500 shares for the long term system 
and we bought 500 shares for the short term system so the long term system was using a big zoom level which is this high low high low high low high low this one it was not looking at the smaller moves here the long term system that's why the 500 shares on the long term system the stop was here but the 500 share the short term system is looking at stuff like this also the short term system is looking at smaller moves are you following this it's more zoomed in the short term system so it's looking at this high low high low high low that's why the stop on the short term system is here the long term system will not use this stop because it does not look so closely at the market it does not zoom in so much that's how we define the long term system so every system is defined conceptually like a uh, according to a zoom level okay visually and every system is defined by a unique stop at any point of time so here you see at this point of time for the short term system the stop was here so when we say dollar risk per trade actually what we mean is dollar risk per unique stop level because here we were actually using the stop level for two trades the 500 shares which came from the short term system here okay and then the other additional shares whatever that number was that we were buying here so it's not really one trade it's two trades but actually we are still using the risk per trade see the short term system just like you got this number right now 53000 we derived the 53000 number for the short term system also you would you have to do this calculation for every trading system that you are employing you could be employing five different trading systems trading in five different time frames okay you can see here just looking at this chart this is a cable chart okay you can see by looking at this chart how many different time frames and you can even increase the number of time frames straight away from here you can see how many different time frames you can uh, uh, visualize in uh, each for 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 one given market this here the market is all the same but the time frames are very different when you look at this versus when you look at this the time frame is very very different okay so you can visualize many time frames and each trading system should be thought of as operating in one time frame that is one one zoom level and therefore when you look at this high low high low distribution uh, therefore each zoom level will have a unique stop because here because we are saying this high has not yet been exceeded by these highs so this is the highest low from which a new high was made so the long term system stop will be here the short term system stop will be here so the zoom level is different so when we are using the risk per trade figure for the long term system for the short term system and putting it here it's actually applying it's actually applicable to two trades one coming from here and one put on over here so it's actually the risk per unique stop level are you following what i'm trying to say right that for each system every system will have a particular stop at a point of time it will have only one stop for each system at a point of time because the system will have a view in this case the short term system view was it's going up okay so therefore it was going to go long and in that case when you look at it there will always be one unique stop for every system are you following these things are very important to understand i think you can understand it visually if you think about it a little bit then you will understand the picture these are things which are difficult to explain uh, understand kind of rationally but more visually and uh, you get the concept as well okay the unique stop the idea this is a very important idea that every trading system is defined by if you are trading from a technical perspective first you can have many trading systems depending on your zoom level okay and then every trading system therefore is defined by a zoom level and also defined by a uh, also will have a unique stop level associated with it at a point of time like here the short term trading system when the market was coming here it had not broken down when it was coming here we thought the short term trading system is also pointing upwards and therefore the stop for that had to be over here because that would have destroyed the uptrend right so every trading system is defined by a zoom level and is also basically going to have one unique stop which uh, is associated with that trading system at a point of time is this clear okay so risk per trade really means risk per unique trading uh risk per unique um what was i saying unique stop level okay risk per unique so this is what i mean risk per trade actually means risk per unique stop trigger level stop trigger level means every stop order has to have a trigger level when you place a stop order here stop sell order the trigger level is here roughly 2207 right are you following this you understand what is stop trigger level stop trigger level is that parameter the stop orders have one parameter 
that stop trigger level is the parameter okay so here also the stop trigger level sell stop order stop trigger level is around 2032 okay is this clear so therefore so now what so that's what we mean essentially that uh, so that's how you're going to operate the system right basically once you derive this like this you've done here you derived a figure of 106,000 here because there's 250 trades for whatever this trading system is now when you are using this trading system every time you're putting on a trade against a unique stop if it's 106,000 okay if it's 106,000 against this then you will size the position in such a way that when this stop gets taken out the gross loss is going to be 106,000 okay okay so another thing that we should emphasize here with which is actually a point with respect to pyramiding okay when we discuss pyramiding that you should apply this risk per trade okay risk per unique stop level only on a gross basis not on a net basis what do i mean by that we just we, we just go to this pyramiding point here okay this is all um, yeah on the pyramiding positions the ross limits like risk per trade first understand what i'm saying it's already there in your notes you don't have to write this um, loss limits when we're talking about loss limits what we are talking about is this okay loss limits which is your risk per trade the loss limit is given by your risk per trade okay that this should apply on a gross basis not on a net basis what i mean by that is this that go back to this example where we bought a thousand shares of tcs over here okay we bought a thousand shares 500 for the long term system 500 for the short term system okay so when the market has already risen to this point and let's say this all this has not happened we are over here in the market right so when we are thinking of putting on additional uh, risk okay additional uh, position an additional position to pyramid our positions so the stop on the 500 shares bought here for the short term system the stop is over here right are you following okay so the 500 shares we bought here around 2105 when it gets stopped out at 2208 is it going to lose money or is it going to make money the 500 shares for the short term system which we bought at 2100 2105 which will eventually get stopped there's a trailing stop for that position here right we raise the trailing stop here to 2207 or whatever when that 500 shares for the short term system bought over here gets stopped out by the trailing stop triggering at this level is it going to make a profit or a loss it's a profit because 500 shares i bought at this and i've raised the trailing stop to this level so now when the trailing stop is triggered no no when the trailing one sec try to understand what am i talking about i'm talking about the 500 shares we bought over here for the short term system when we first bought it the stop for both short term and long term was over here but when the market ra rallied so far uh, you know so so much higher we raised the stop for the short term position to this level so it's a trailing stop remember you learned about trailing stops yesterday what forgotten we use the word trailing stop yesterday we used the word trailing stop we learned about trailing stop this is called a trailing stop because you have raised the stop it's trailing the market the donkey system uses trailing stops right we use the word yesterday this is what happens when you don't pay attention and don't go home and revise okay even stuff that has been taught yesterday you're looking blank trailing stop it's trailing the market so it is following the market okay but a little bit behind okay so it's a trailing stop so the if i bought it here for 500 shares and i'm going to have a trailing stop triggered at this level visually obviously i'm going to make money even though it's going to trigger the trailing stop i'm going to make money that's why we don't call them stop loss orders we call them stop orders technically because all when every stop order triggers it does not necessarily mean that there's a loss in this case there's actually a profit you're locking in a profit okay so now the point is that this when i say that pyramiding should be done by applying the risk per trade concept on a gross basis remember this short term system there is some risk per trade number which has come out of this kind of calculation and let's say it's hundred and six thousand dollars okay you've done some kind of calculation for the stop short term system you came out with a risk per trade number that actually that risk per trade number is a risk per unique stop level for that system right so let's say the short term system the risk per trade is 106 risk per unique stop level is 106000 dollars okay 
but you already bought 500 shares here and that will get stopped out here so this will make a profit so now should you take hundred and six thousand dollars plus the profit that you are making on this lot from here and then decide the extra amount you're going to buy are you going to take that risk are you following what I'm saying see for instance here when we are talking about this part let's cover this if the triggering of trailing stops on mm, earlier put on earlier okay or let's make it much earlier to make it clear where if the triggering of trading stops on positions put on much earlier comma here what am I talking about on positions put on I'm talking about this this position I put on much earlier for 500 shares for the short term system okay 2100 roughly and this is the trailing stop for that position I put on over here okay now this is the trailing stop when this stop triggers there will be a profit on this 500 share lot okay so that profit let's say that profit is let's say um, uh, will result in a profit of say um, say okay that x dollar should not be added to the predefined risk per trade in this case this is $106,000 for this example that we are discussing our system has given the calculation they have given up given us $106,000 as a risk per trade okay so let's say that uh, then we are also going to make x dollars on this amount we are also going to make x dollars on the triggering of the stop between from here 500 shares bought at this point stopped out at this point that will result in a profit of x dollars let's say so the point my point is that when you are talking about how many what position size we should put on here so that the total loss when this thing is triggered on both the positions does not exceed my risk per trade you should not take that calculation on a net basis you should take it on a gross basis that means basically what i'm saying is that the profit you're making on this earlier position from here to here that should not be factored in are you following what i'm saying that you risk basically you look at your position just you know from here because otherwise what will happen is you will end up taking a bigger position so see because if you are let's say you are allowed to risk only hundred and six thousand dollars okay on this position on this uh, stop so here you will put on a position in a certain way okay you will put let's say that leads to let's say five thousand shares if you are allowed to lose only hundred and six thousand dollars when this stop is triggered and you are trying to buy the number of shares some number of shares here you may come up with a number saying five thousand shares you can only buy five thousand shares as 2235 and then have it stopped out at 2204 okay which let's say that number is five thousand are you following so 2204 2233 we can do this number calculation here itself uh, we still have a little bit of time okay let me just make this calculation here so that we are clear are you guys following so far are you following so far I'm trying to illustrate what is you you understand what we are trying to do let's try and make make sure you understand what we are trying to do we bought five we bought thousand shares here half 500 for the long-term system 500 for the short-term system long-term system is still running with a stop here short-term system the market has gone up here okay now we don't we assume that the market is here 2235 all this stuff has not happened we assume that it has not happened so at 2235 i'm wondering i need to pyramid how many more shares can i afford to buy without breaking my risk rules but still uh, be able to pyramid my position i need to increase my position the market is moving in my favor i need to be more aggressive like a poker player right so I can see already that I have 500 shares here. Let's can do this calculation here. 
I have let's say the stop is 2207 okay let's go back to this I'm going back to the other sheet now okay so I have let's say uh, how did we define this okay let's do it one more time ourselves so that we don't have a problem okay so 2207 is our stop okay and um, 2207 we are just writing 2207 last stop and 2235 is when we are proposing to buy new tra new shares okay so we are proposing to buy at 2235 okay and we have uh, another thing which is 2100 and we bought let's say we bought this as 2100 and we are going to stop at 2207 okay okay so we bought this as 2100 okay so we bought 500 shares okay for 2100 so when we for this we are going to for this 500 share lot we are going to make a profit of 500 into 2207 minus 2100 okay we are going to make this 53,000 let's assume this all in dollars okay we are going to make this profit okay and additionally we have let's say just hundred and six thousand dollars hundred and six thousand is what we are allowed to lose per train because of our system calculations system calculation is saying that stop per unique risk per unique stop level for the short term system is hundred and six thousand dollars because of this calculation we did earlier here okay for this calculation right are you following it yeah, from this week yeah. No, no, here let's assume 250 doesn't matter. It's just going to make you 100. It's the same thing. I'm just saying by this process, you have derived this. Okay. You can change it to 300. Also, you'll get a different number. But we assume 250 trades in this. And by this process, what I mean is by this process, we have derived 106,000. Yes. Okay. So let's say we are applying this 106,000. So which means we are saying that when this stop is triggered, we should not lose more than $106,000. Okay. But this stop is going to be ap applying to two positions. One from here, from before, for which this is the trailing stop. And the new one we are buying at 2235. The question is, how many shares can we afford to buy at 2235? Okay. So there are two ways to do this calculation. I'll just take two minutes and try to finish off and then we'll maybe start the next class five minutes late okay so what we are saying is are you with me so far are you following so far what is our decision problem we need to figure out how many shares can we afford to buy without breaking our risk rules at 2235 so that both lots the one 500 shares from here and the new one we buy here both will be stopped out at this level and that should not lead to a break of our risk rule of one hundred six thousand dollars in this system right okay so we can do it in two ways this 106,000 should be calculated on a gross basis or a net basis that's what I'm telling you so the rule the advice I'm giving you is when pyramiding you should take this 106,000 the risk per trade okay that's what the language says here what is the language saying loss limits risk per trade should apply on a gross basis not on a net basis okay understand the language now what do i mean by that this is what i mean by that you could take this 106000 on a gross basis or you could take it on a net basis that is you could say that because see 53500 profit you are going to make when this stop is triggered when this stop is triggered on the earlier lot you are going to make 53500 profit so then why not add the to the 106,000 which I am anyway able to take a raw risk on 106,000 for this trade but then I have a profit coming from the earlier position of 53,000 so why not add 53,500 to this I can add this and then I can are you following what I'm saying because if I risk 159,000 on this uh, new stop on uh, against this stop if I take a total risk of 159,000 my actual net loss will still be only 106,000 because my uh, from the uh, from the on the new position when I'm deciding the size of the new position if I assume that on the new position I can afford to lose 159,000 and okay and I put on the new position in that manner then I will okay I will lose 159,000 on the new position but on the old position I'll make 553,500 yes or no 
if I decide to size my new position in such a way that I lose 159.500, okay, on the new position, on the new lot, which I'm buying at 22.35, okay, then I will lose 159.500 on the new position, which I buy, whatever that amount is, let's say 5,000 shares. I buy 5,000 at 22.35 and such, a, and that 5,000 comes out of a calculation that I should be uh, not, I should not lose more than 159.500. So on the new lot, I will, I, on the second lot, I lose 159,000, but on the first lot, I make 53,500. Yes or no? The first lot I bought at 2100 and I'm selling at 2207, so I'm making this. So then on a net basis, on the triggering of the stop, I'm losing only 106. Yes or no? Yes. Right? But what I'm saying is you should not do it in this way. You should do it. This is the net basis. This is the net basis of calculation of risk per trade because you're taking the profit of the previous positions and applying it to this one. Okay. So this will result in variable risk per unique stop, which is not good. And then it will, you're taking, you're not taking some money off the table. You're not protecting your profit. Okay. So therefore, this is not the right approach. The right approach, what I'm saying is should be applied on a gross basis, which means you should calculate your, what is our decision problem? How many shares can I afford to buy at 2235? Okay. With this plan. So the answer to that is, this is the stop 2207. So if I enter at 2235 and I lose money uh, and I exit at 2207, I'm losing $28, let's assume dollars per share. And I can afford to lose only $106,000, not $159,000. So I should divide 106 by 28. And that will give me this number, which is what I can afford to number of shares i can afford to buy is 3785 actually with around it comes to 3786 so it will be under are you following what i'm saying yes, so this is what is meant so all these things so you see how complicated it is to manage profitable when the market is moving in your direction how much work is involved when you have to pivot you have to think through all these things these are all decision problems technically i am just telling you don't do this don't do it on a net basis but you can always say, I mean, who are you to tell me not to do it on a gross net basis? I can decide to do you do it on net basis. That means you are solving, but this is a decision problem. Are you following that this is a decision problem? How should I do it? Net or gross? Okay. All right. So today.